straight into the main part. <laughs> Before I get into the main part of the talk, uh, I'm going to dismiss this. this thing. All right. Uh, no, I'm not going to leave me. Uh, so I want to I want to tell you guys a little story. And um, as I tell you the story, I want you to think about tasks and information seeking. Okay. So this is the story about a man. Some of you guys may recognize this person and his very beautiful and smart wife. Some of you guys have met Miranda, but no, you haven't. This is Miranda, my wife. And the day that we decided to install an eco B thermostat in our house, okay, this is one of these smart thermostats that was going to change our life and save us lots of money on our heating and cooling bills and make it so that I can turn on the heating or air conditioning in my house in North Carolina from here in Austin, right? All right, so uh, unboxing experience. Here, here's the EcoB unit. Here's a mounting plate. Uh, I like that the mounting plate came with a little level built into it, so I didn't have to even own a level. I did, but it had one. And it came with these stickers that had weird little letters on them, like R and Y1 and things like this. And so that this was going to be for labeling the wires to my thermostat. And this was the first indication that we had that this was going to be a challenging problem. Right, so when you get little stickers that say label the wires at your thermostat and label the wires at the control board, you know that something's up. Now, I didn't mention that I have a PhD in computer science and Miranda has a PhD in industrial engineering. So we felt like we should be up to this task. Okay. So think about the tasks. So it came with an installation manual, came with these wire labels. And so we needed to go out and learn about the wiring in our system. So every HVAC unit is a little bit different and they kind of give you these general guidelines about what to do, but you do have to figure out what these wires mean in your context. So the first thing I did was I went out on the internet and tried to read up on what kind of HVAC system we had and how it might interface with these wirings, right? So I looked at some things online discussion forums. I looked at some things from other people that had installed Nico Bees, tried to learn what was gonna be involved. Um, now, I also knew that this was going to involve power and that I didn't want to mess around with hot wires in the house and I needed to turn the electricity off with the HVAC system. So I went out to our garage and looked at our breaker box and flipped the switch that I knew we have a label on there that I don't have printed on here, but there's a label that says that this is the HVAC unit. And so then I went back inside and I was like, well, I, I want to be sure I got this right. I don't want to touch a wire that's live. So I got my voltage tester out and I put the voltage tester next to the wire and it didn't light up, which I thought was a good sign. But then I was like, huh, I haven't used this voltage tester for a long time. Um, let me try out an outlet that I know is good. So I took it over to an outlet that I knew was turned on and it didn't light up. So I was like, oh no. Uh, I don't know if this whole tester works or not. Maybe the batteries are dead. So then I spent about 20 minutes trying to figure out how to open the batteries on the damn thing to change the batteries in the voltage tester. Okay, That involves some internet research. It involves watching some videos on YouTube. And it, it sounds crazy, but I could not figure out how to open this thing. It just didn't seem like it would open. So at that point, we started looking at the device more closely. And we started to question whether we were really competent people or not. <laughs> well, we eventually figured out how to change the batteries and we eventually got the voltage tester working and decided the power was turned off. Now, at this point, we went up to the unit, the old controller unit. We took it off the wall and it had a bunch of wires and things that looked like this. Now, some of these labels, this W2, Y2, some of these were were the same things that were on the stickers. So, hey, this is, this is good. Maybe I can do this after all. Um, so we started unhooking. Well, I took a picture so that I remembered everything. We started unhooking things, and then I got those little stickers out, and I started putting them on. Everything was going great, and then there was this one wire that didn't have a sticker. I didn't know what to do with it, right? And so more internet research, what do I do with this seat wire? I don't even know what a C wire is. I don't know if I need it or if I don't need it. That involved finding out what kind of HVAC system I had, 
It involved finding out whether I was multi stage or single stage or a couple other parameters in my system. Eventually, we figured that out, got the wires taken off. All right. So then uh, the new thermostat came with this nice mounting bracket. But one of the things you might notice here is that the old mounting bracket had screws horizontally here. And the new mounting bracket had screws that went vertically. All right, no problem. I just need to get some anchor bolts and you know, drill into the wall and put the anchor bolts in so that I can mount the new unit. So I started working on that. And this screw, when I started drilling in, I immediately hit a stud in the wall. I also knew that there were wires running really close to that stud that I didn't want to screw up, right? So I'm sitting there with the drill in my hand thinking, do I just go ahead and drill through the stud? I'm probably going to miss any wires that are there. Do I need to have another solution to this? And at that point, I was like, all right, let's not mess this up. And so I tried to come up with some creative solution to make it so that I could get this screw far enough in that it would hold but that it wouldn't require me to actually drill into the stud. Okay. So there's some creativity involved there. I eventually figured that out. Um, then we attached the wires. That went reasonably well. We had to do some more research on the HVAC unit there. Um, that also involved a little bit of reading online discussion forums. And eventually we plugged the whole thing and it said hi. So, all right, at least we had power to it. At that point, though, we had to set up the network on it. We had to set up the programming for it. We had to get it interfaced with our phones, all of these other things that I won't go into. More internet searching, more internet searching. We started this at about nine on a Saturday morning, and it was about 3.30 when we finished. And so at that point, we were just like, we're done. We're just done. It's time for pizza and a beer. Sorry, I'm in Texas. So, <laughs> um, so it's time for pizza and a beer. So I guess the, the good news is that after all of that, we are still happily married. <laughs> um, a, a friend of mine once said that if you and your significant other can learn to ballroom dance and wallpaper a house together, your marriage is in pretty good shape. <laughs> and I would add to it if you can install an eco thermostat. So, all right. Um, so what did, what did we learn about tasks from the story? Right. So I'm going to ask you guys, what what did we learn about tasks from that story? I'm glad that I hired an electrician. I, yes, I wish I had. So, okay, electricians make money for good reasons. What else? You know, any subtasks. There were a lot of subtasks, right? And there were subtasks that I didn't know about beforehand. So yeah, the beforehand part of this, what I was thinking, you cannot prepare. Uh, too much about something you don't have prior experience bringing up. Right, right. So there were things in there that, that I didn't even know were going to come and be an issue. Okay. Um, there are just has to that are very unfamiliar and uncertain to you. Unfamiliar and uncertain, and that had a relatively high cost of failure. Right. Mm -hmm. If I screwed this up, we were no longer going to have heating and cooling in the house. And then you have marriage, maybe. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's even more serious than I put it in. Okay. All right. So, so there are a lot of things going on there, especially with subtasks that were unseen. Now, I didn't highlight all of these, but at a lot of those juncture points, I was spending like 10 minutes on my phone, or at some point I moved off my phone and just went onto my desktop computer because I needed more screen real estate to figure out how to do this stuff. And then I would come back and I would try whatever the internet told me to do. And if it worked, right? If it didn't, then I'd have to come back and do more searches. Okay. This is situated task. This is a very situated task. This is a cross session task. It involved me searching multiple times over different sessions. It involved a lot of uncertainty. All right. So these are not new ideas to information scientists. We, we know that these things happen, right? We have models that talk about information objects and interfaces and retrieval engines and my cognitive space and things that talk about the context that I'm working in. We 
We have other models that talk about sort of users and interfaces and the environment in this situation. We have models that think about these things. So this is not an entirely new thing. But um, I think it's something that is uh, often overlooked in the development of interfaces, okay? Or maybe not taken as far as it could be. And so real world tasks involve a lot of these components. They involve information, <laughs> sure. Uh, they are often multi step processes. They often involve things at different levels of task complexity. Learning. Some of you guys work in the searches learning community. I had to learn a lot about the wiring and the HVAC unit in my house. Now, I've, I've forgotten most of it since then, but at the time I had to learn it. There was some creativity involved. I had to figure out how I was going to get that bolt to stick in uh, when I ran into the stud. And I definitely could have used more assistance than I had from the search engine. The search engine had no idea what I was actually trying to do. I was typing commands or queries to it and hoping to find something that was going to help me. Okay, so real world tasks involved a lot of these things. So our lab at UNC has been looking at these things. And so I'm going to kind of take you guys through a little bit of a tour here of some of the things that we have learned uh, over the last few years in, in each of these categories and hopefully stimulate some discussion or uh, comments. So as I go through this, please, please, please feel free to interrupt me, ask questions, uh, derail me, whatever. I've got more slides than I'll probably cover for today. So if you want to ask me things, we can spend time on them. Let's talk for a minute about task complexity. So some of you guys may have studied task complexity or read about it. Um, in information science, we tend to think about task complexity in a couple different ways. One is how many paths are there to get to where I'm going, right? If there's a lot of paths through the information to get to where I'm going, maybe that's a more complicated task. That's one way of thinking about task complexity. Another way of thinking about task complexity is what are the cognitive processes that are involved? So if it's a very simple task that just involves me remembering something, that's a lower level complex or cognitive process than a task that involves me drawing comparisons between two things or evaluating two things and comparing things. Another way that people have studied uh, complexity is to talk about the a priori determinability of a task. In other words, do you know what the solution is going to look like? Not do you know the answer, but do you know what the solution is going to look like? So if I ask, what's the capital of Australia? I know that the answer is the name of a city. I may not know that the answer is Canberra, but I know that the answer is the name of a city, right? Okay. For some tasks, you don't even know what the answer is going to look like, right? So in this, in this uh, task of installing the, the thermostat, I knew what the eventual goal was, but there were a lot of intermediate steps that I didn't know that they were doing. And so that aspect of determinability can make a task more difficult. So in general, we think of complex tasks as requiring more effort and being more difficult. Yes. Good question. Is there an antonym to determinability that is similar? In terms of That's a great question, Elliot. Um, uh, not determinable. Indeterminability. Not indeterminability. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I, I, I would, I, you could probably argue something that would have an ambiguous or a uh, less well defined. <laughs> Right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, um, one of my colleagues, Jaime Arguello, who I work a lot with, and I got interested in how can you characterize tasks and how, how can we understand things about tasks that make them more difficult or not? And so, we did some work where we focused on comparative tasks. So, a comparative task is one where you're trying to compare one or more things. I want to purify water. I'm going to go on some camping trip, but I'm going to need to purify water from a nearby stream. And I can either use chemical tablets or boiling water to do this. And I want to compare those two methods and find out what's going to be the best. Okay, so that's a, a relatively high cognitive level task. I'm making a comparison. So what we were doing in this is we kind of said, all right, you can divide those kinds of tasks up according to, I'm going to compare chemical tablets, boiling, charcoal filters, the items that I'm using to do the task. Or 
I could compare those tasks along another dimension that says, I want to know how much time is required to purify the water, or how many organisms are eliminated, or how it tastes after you've done that method, right? So these are sort of the items that I'm using, and these are sort of objective and subjective dimensions that I'm using to evaluate the method. And we did a series of studies where it turns out that if you give somebody sort of a completely unconstrained task, learn about water purification, compare methods for water purification. I gave you no constraints. In that task, people found it to be the easiest, they did the most satisfying, and the results that they kind of bookmarked or selected were the least diverse. Why do you guys think that is? We have ideas, but I want to see what your ideas are. People just went with the, the first thing that came to mind. They didn't try to look for alternatives or compare them. So That's exactly good. right. So in this broad learn about water purification methods, you just took whatever was at the top and said, that's good enough, good enough, right? And everybody did that, so the results that they bookmarked were less diverse. When we specified the items, so when I said, okay, I want you to compare chemical tablets versus boiling as methods for water pur purification, people found that task to be more concrete, it narrowed the scope down, and it actually made the task easier. I've given you concrete, tangible things that you can go search for, boiling water, right? Interestingly, when I gave you these dimensions, these objective and subjective dimensions, that actually made the task more abstract. People felt like the task was, was near, uh, more abstract and it became more difficult. What's interesting about that is take something like taste. Well, when I gave you an item like boiling water or chemical tablets, I gave you something to search for. You could search for boiling water to purify them, you know, chemical tablets to purify water. When I give you a constraint like taste, people express taste in lots of different ways. And so this is not something that translated as directly into a search term as this did. So what we try to do in this uh, work sort of tease apart another dimension to task complexity and say, look, it's not just about a constraint, it's about the type of constraint that you give. So if your task has a constraint, it's a very tangible noun phrase kind of thing, that is probably going to make this task easier. If your constraint is a more amorphous kind of concept, it's probably going to make this task more difficult to search for. Well, why is time required more of all this? Would that not be quite specific? Yeah, so it is. And, and I'll tell you, the reason I have these group objective and subjective, these were the most difficult. These were not as difficult. The problem with things like time requirement is it's not necessarily expressed, again, in the same noun phrase. I don't search for time required. Somebody tells me, oh, it takes, you have to boil the water for 15 minutes, right? Whereas here, the documents contain boiling. Just to clarify, so in the experimental sub, you would say, um, you know, find me ways of purifying water that have, you know, and, and talk about them in terms of their time required. And you didn't give them anything in green. And so they had to think up different ways, or they had we, to- We actually did all the combinations. Uh, okay. We did some where it was all broad. We did some where it was just items, some where it was just dimensions, and we did combinations. Okay. So, yeah. Um, if you're interested, this one, this ETIR paper is the one that really gets into the depths of that one. So, so uh, are there differences between the objective and subjective uh, tasks in terms of such results? Um, well, in some ways, it's all based on search results, right? Um, but uh, yeah, I would argue that, that yes, the subjective here um, were even harder. And we did a follow-on study where we actually focused on those two. I think that's this other paper. Um, and to be honest with you, I can't remember the exact. It was very close. It was very close. There were a few things that the subjective dimensions made harder. But in general, these kinds of dimensions were much, make a task much harder than the, the noun grade type items. All right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm wondering about um, 
asking um, the participants to uh, come up with a constraint? Would, it, would that make it uh, no. more harder? That's interesting. Um, so my guess is that if I just allowed you to come up with a constraint, you would probably come up with a constraint that you knew you could satisfy. And so uh, it might make it harder than the totally unconstrained version, but it would probably not be as hard as if I imposed a constraint on you. Just my guess. All right. Um, so we've also been doing a lot of work in our lab on search assistance tools. And if uh, any of you guys have followed our labs, we know that we like to build little widgets that sit over to the side of a search results page and see if we can help users to do tasks. And so I'm gonna show you a couple of these today. And again, this is sort of a whirlwind tour. I don't have time to go into all of the details, but if you're interested, ask me and I can try to tell you more about it. So one of the first ones that we looked at was something called the search guide. Um, and the idea for the search guide is really simple. I'm searching for something today. Chances are somebody else has searched for that same thing three weeks ago. Probably a lot of people have searched for similar things in the past. Would it be beneficial if I could see the search path or the search trail that they had gone down? Or would it just be super distracting, right? I mean, if I saw the search trail that you followed, maybe you conceptualize the task entirely differently from me, and I'm gonna waste all this time looking at your search trail and it's not gonna help me, I don't know. And so that's what we set out to find. So we built a little uh, widget that would sit over to the side of the search results that had three search trails from previous users. So each of these is a query. So this user entered fair trade, then they entered fair trade coffee, what does fair trade coffee entail were the requirements. So that was their series of queries. And if I click on one of these to expand it, it shows me the results that they bookmarked from that query, okay? So I can not only see the trail, but I can see the pages that they thumbs up. Um, so we took this widget and stuck it over on the side of a page and let people do some search tasks with it. And this was a lab study. Um, and so, one of the things that we took away from this is not really surprising, but it's a lesson that I keep learning over and over again when I study search. People like to start searches on their own. No matter what kind of assistance we seem to provide them, everybody always wants to start out on their own and see how far they can get. I think that's just a, a human nature kind of thing. It's like the, I'm being a lucky button, right? It's like maybe, maybe I'll search for it, and the top result could just be what I want. Okay. Um, now, we gave them tasks that were different levels of task complexity, right? We we're kind of obsessed with task complexity. And so we gave them tasks that were simple tasks and complex tasks. For the simple tasks, they tended to find the answer on their own. And then they used the search guide, the trails over here, to verify that they had found the correct answer. You know, I searched for the capital of Australia, I came up with Canberra. But Canberra, why is it not Sydney? You know, is that right? And they would go look over here and verify. Okay. For more complex tasks, they actually were using these trails to get ideas about new directions to go in for their own search. So they would start their search, they would get to some point where they would get stuck or stumped, and then they would come over here to the search guide and look at what other people had done. And what's interesting is that even though all of these things in the search guide were clickable, you could click on this and it would reissue that query just like you had typed it in instead of the other person. What they tended to do is they look at this and then they would type stuff into their own search query. So they were using this as a resource, but then it would translate it over into their own space. Um, another thing that we took away from this study, and in retrospect, this is not a surprise, but we asked a bunch of questions about user satisfaction with this tool. And when the tool was available and failed to deliver. So sometimes these trails weren't so good. Sometimes they were great, sometimes they weren't so good. In the cases where they weren't so good and the person engaged with the search guide, they rated the system the lowest. It was like we promised them something and then we didn't come through, right? And so um, if you're gonna have these kinds of tools, uh, they need to work. 
Big blast. Right. right. All right. Um, another tool that we've been working with a lot over the last couple of years is a tool called the Org Box. Yeah, Matt. On that feature, was was it just questions about how well it helped them solve their particular task? Was there also some bit about usually searchers are often just curious about what other people are, are doing. Even if yeah. they help me solve the thing I was looking for, it's almost like a sense of either normalizing or discovery. I wonder if your questions asked. I, I wish we had asked questions about the discovery, I, and we didn't. Yeah. Um, it was mostly just about me, how well did the tool help you yeah. to find what you're looking for. Um, we did not ask questions like, do you feel more aware of what other people have been searching for, or do you feel more confident? Well, we did ask, I think we asked confidence questions, how yeah. confident they were in their own search. Or did it make you want to search for something we, else? We did not ask that. Yeah. 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 Um, that's one of those that uh, Wish, wish I could have gone back. Yes, I was, uh, I'm wondering about um, giving um, users uh, search trials when um, search systems uh, algorithms can also provide uh, that implicitly. So like for what we did was to directly or explicitly give to the uh, Participants, they like search trials, but did you consider what would be the what's like just the effect of the search trail? Not quite sure I understand the question. Um, I mean, we, we we basically presented them the search trail. Yeah. And they could use it or not. They didn't have to engage with it. Um, like we gave them three paths, three search trails from different users. These were from from other people that had done a search like this. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, some people didn't use the tool at all. Yes, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about um, the aspect where we have, we could have uh, sex trails uh, right. in the sex results, like the sex results will be given based on sex trails. Oh, I see, I see. Yes, so I'm making this a separate thing. Uh, yes. Change the ranking, do something. Yes, like, yes, yes. Okay, uh, that, uh, that's a great question. That's a very good question. And that's a question that we often face in the research that I tend to do in our lab where we put little tools over on the side. Because the question is, do you put a tool over the side with the information that you have, or do you just incorporate it into your ranking algorithm somehow? Mm -hmm. um, and it's a great question. Uh, this is the route that we've chosen to focus a lot of our work on because I like to look at tools that people can choose to engage with or not, and they can explicitly see what the representation is. Whereas when you put it in a ranking algorithm, it's sort of hidden behind the scenes. And I'm not knocking that. That's sometimes a great thing to do. Um, but we just haven't, we haven't focused much that way. Um, we had a couple of students in our lab that have done some work on, on re-ranking stuff, but I don't think I have any slides on this question. Um, so another tool that we have been playing with is called the Org Box. And this tool was um, sort of generated out of a study that we did on people's note-taking behaviors when they do searches. So we had people do searches, we had them take notes while they were searching, and we watched how they organized their notes, and what they did with those. And one of the things that we found was that they used very, very simple structures to organize their notes. They used like lists with headings, they use little groupings or boxes of things. Um, they occasionally drew arrows between things, and they often nested things in some kind of hierarchy. Um, but there were not many people out there drawing um, concept maps, for example. So what we did is we built a, a simple tool that um, you, know, you can have your, your search results up over here, and then you've got this sort of blank canvas over here where you can drag things off of the search results or off the landing pages over into these boxes that you can create in this space. So here's an example of one of the boxes. And so the person has labeled this box ethics about cloning specifically for humans, and they drug three things into this box. They drug this quote from an article, this quote from an article, and this other quote from an article. And you can drag these into a hierarchy if you want to. Um, but this is basically, uh, the, the nuts and bolts of the interface. You can add 
a, a tag or a note to the item, but that's about it. You just drag things over. And then these boxes can be rearranged and organized. So this is overview of cloning. This is ethics about cloning. This is shortcomings. You can sort of organize your information. Would they drag them from the SERP or from the you can, actual? You can either drag it from the SERP or from the landing page. So in, in like these cases with these longer quotes, that you come in from the landing pages, right? Okay. Um, so this is drag and drop. You can copy paste as you would rather. Okay. Um, we, we thought this would be an interesting interface to sort of see if it helped the scaffold people in organizing and structuring their cognitive processes while they did tasks. Um, but we also wanted to look at this compared to a baseline that we felt was fair. So we had also created a counterpart thing that we called the order doc, for lack of a better name, that was just basically a rich text widget. You know, we just grabbed this Will.js thing. And so again, you can copy and paste text into this um, and you can bold and italic and number and all that sort of stuff. It's just like a Google Doc. Right, so that was our baseline compare against. Um, so we wanted to know: Did the org box help you more than just the Google Doc would? So we found a bunch of things here, um, and I'll try to kind of go through these relatively quickly. But one of the things we found was that people made more sections of their notes with the org box. They created more separate components than they did in the org doc. Overall, they saved more text. And they saved more text per event. So per drag drop event, they saved more text. They gave your box a higher overall rating. They, they rated it as having higher cognitive and metacognitive support. So this was a really interesting result. Um, they rated it higher in terms of things like understanding and synthesizing the topic, monitoring what they were doing, evaluating their progress on the task, and this was almost significant was the metacognitive planning, what they're going to do next, that sort of thing. So the org box provided this very nice visual way to say, oh, this is the progress I've made. And you know, here are the here are the four, here are the four areas I'm trying to fill up information about. And oh, this one I've got a bunch on, this one I don't have as much on. So that kind of metacognitive process was great to help. Um, we didn't find any difference in terms of their perceptions of usability or search quality or task difficulty. And we took that as a good sign because they were already familiar with Google Doc kind of documents. And so this new tool that we gave them was no harder to use than a Google Doc, but it provided these other benefits. And so um, we did a whole series of studies on this uh, that you can read about. Um, but uh, this one, I think, to me, was most interesting from the metacognitive side. That the tool seemed to help people think about their progress on the task. Yeah. Uh, was there an underlying assumption that the people uh, taking uh, either of these two versions uh, of the exercise that they would usually or typically make notes while searching? Because in my scheme of the world, it does not seem that most casual users would be keeping notes. While that's a good. That's a good searching. point, and and we did not. We did not filter for that. Um, we simply told people to take notes, and that's that's pretty much all we said. So I think there was an implication that we wanted them to take notes, mm -hmm. and that's a valid criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. um, the other uh, uh, direction to think about is you know people taking notes for something, so they have subsequent tasks to complete. And maybe um, the notes they taken in uh, all the box is more useful. For the subsequent tasks. Right? right. That's a good point, too. Yeah, interesting. Um, yes. For most people would not know what metacognition is. Yes. I'm curious how we do operationalize for the ah, okay. Uh, I would have to pull out the questionnaire. I probably have it in my somewhere in my hard drive here, but I'll show it to you later. We we asked questions that were very user approachable operational questions, you know. So um I think the understanding and synthesizing, we actually used those words. But for metacognitive planning, I think we used words like how well did the tool help you think about what to do next or planning your next steps. I don't remember the exact phrasing. No, we didn't say metacognitive planning. <laughs> <laughs> we 
we got a bunch of other tools that we've built that I'm just going to flash up on the screen for you. We have another one that we call the info boxes. And now we like the word boxes in our group, um, where we divided up information into facts, concepts, insights, and opinions. And so as you were doing a task, you can engage with either facts, concepts, insights, or opinions. So we're basically exposing a way for people to parameterize their results, right? Um, and we found some good effects of this. Uh, things that were, in retrospect, maybe not terribly surprising, but that for complex tasks, people really wanted the insights and opinions, right? You know, if you're doing something complicated, like installing a new thermostat, I want those firsthand experiences that other people have had. We also had another tool. This one was a matrix tool that was designed to help people compare things in those comparative tasks. You can drag things into a comparison. Um, and if you want, you can read more about that. I won't get into that one. Um, how do you guys usually do on time? Do you go and ask questions at the end, or do you actually do what? 10 minutes? What's the point of the end? 15 well, minutes? Half an hour? Half an hour. What is it? We are going to two. Oh, we're going to two. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, so the other thing that we've looked at in our lab related to sort of task related information searching um, are some things related to cognitive factors. Um, and then also some things on situational factors I'll mention in another minute. So let me talk about the cognitive factors first. So one of the cognitive factors, one of our PhD students, Bogum Choi, had been really interested in was working memory. Um, are you guys familiar with working memory? I'm seeing a good number of nods, but I see some head shakes too. Okay, so working memory is the idea, um, you know, there's that old stereotype, you can keep five plus or minus thing, plus or minus two things in your head at once in short-term memory. That's kind of the idea. There's short-term and long-term memory, and your working memory has to do with how much capacity you have to hold something. So if I read you a list of numbers and I read you 10 numbers, can you remember that list in order, right? Um, and they're standardized tests from cognitive psychology that can measure this for you. They're very humbling. If you ever want to feel very humble, go take one of those tests. Um, anyway, we were interested in how working memory might impact somebody's search process, right? So if you have lower working memory, very possible that could change the way you're having to go through an information seeking process. And um, that's basically what we found. Uh, people with higher working memory actually did more search actions. So when I say search effort here, I mean they issued more queries, they clicked on more things. Okay. Um, they also had higher outcomes. And I'm going to wave my hands at this a little bit. We kind of graded the outcomes of what they produced. But their outcomes were better according to some quantitative measure. People with lower working memory uh, put in what we call less search effort, meaning they issued fewer queries, they clicked on fewer things. They had lower rated outcomes, and they also did more satisfying. So um, again, this may be one of those results that you. Know, this is one of the things I kind of like about research sometimes when you look at it in retrospect, you're like, oh, yeah, yeah, that makes sense, right? This is one of the cases where it kind of makes sense. It's, and this is, I don't know if familiar with, uh, you know, this technological achievement and sort of concept. Mm -hmm. Is working memory right here operationalized as a characteristic of a person or a relationship between a person and a topic? It is, it is an inherent characteristic of the person. Okay, because yeah. I wonder, I mean, I, I feel like empirically, just anecdotally, man, maybe, I know people who have seem to have very low working memory for some things, right. and extremely yeah. high working memory for other things. Um, so, anyways. That's so, so um, that's a great discussion to have. So, there's a bunch of these kind of measures. Um, our lab has looked at things like need for cognition. Okay, so need for cognition is another one of these things that you can go and take a test and it will tell you where you rate on the need for cognition scale. And people who rate highly on the need for cognition scale are more likely to do deep dives on things. And people that rate lower on the need for cognition scale are more likely to just take the first answer and try to satisfy us. Um, those, 
especially in need for cognition, um, I, I, I feel what you're saying, right? I mean, there are certain things that I'm just more inherently interested in than other things. Um, but in theory, working memory it is not like that. It is more of one of these, I, I have a capacity for working memory. Now, you might be chunking things differently in different domains. You know, you may be an expert chess player and so you're able to chunk whole sets of moves together, but, you know, but in your study, you hold that the domain constant. So we don't like, domain the constant apply necessarily. We don't do the domain constant, but but um, I'm trying to remember in this study, if we must have asked them to require knowledge of that domain, but I don't I don't think it had an effect. So. Well, working memory is correlated with positive intelligence. So what's this really telling us? Um, well, so I'll tell you one of the things that we were hoping to get out of this was some ideas about how we could help people with both higher and lower working memory achieve the kind of search goals that they wanted to, right? And so um, the observation, like you said, I mean, I think it makes a lot of sense when you look at it, but we empirically measured it, right? We said, okay, look, these people really did do more queries and it's not just about the outcomes, but they actually explored more things. I guess I mean one thing might be the work and memory capacity over a lifetime may shift. So, you know, as you age, your working memory capacity might might alter, and that yeah. sort of possibly might tell us something about aging movements. Possibly, yeah. I mean, our I think one of our goals was to say. Um, you know, if, if you were a user that had lower working memory, could we get your outcomes to be equivalent to the higher, right? Um, and we have done some later work where we tried to do scaffolding and tools to help with that. And um, without going into too many details, one of the things that we found in that study was that the higher working memory people took advantage of the tools and used them, but the lower didn't. So, yeah. Um, how is satisfying operationalized? Ah, uh, that's a good question. I have to remember this study. Um, I think in this study it had to do with things like taking results at uh, lower ranks, but higher on the page, right? I think that's one of the ways we operationalized it. I think it also may have gotten operationalized in time on task also. Um, Another kind of constraint that we've looked at, some of you guys know Anita Crescenzi, uh, who's a PhD student at, at UNC. Um, she was very interested in looking at the effects of time constraints on these tasks, right? So often our tasks are situated within some time constraint. The bus is coming. I need to know if I'm going to be able to catch it or not. Um, and so when you're in a time constraint situation, what happens to your search process? Now, time constraints have been studied in other domains, but haven't really been looked at too much in the context of search. And so um, as sort of a brief uh, overview of what Anita found was that um, when you do have a time constraint, you feel it, you feel the time pressure, okay? Um, it makes the task more difficult. You end up doing more metacognitive processing. Oh my gosh, am I gonna be able to finish this task? Am I finding the right things? What should I do next? Don't know about my heart, right? lower satisfaction in your output and results, and we observed acceleration behaviors uh, and adaptation behaviors. So you're just actually working faster and you're changing the kinds of searches that you do. You're searching for things that you think are gonna give you more results. So time constraints definitely uh, are an interesting area. To, and if any of y'all are PhD students that are interested in time constraints, I think this is a fascinating area of study. So, um, I also want to talk for a minute about cross session searching. So, in the example that I gave, there was a lot of sequencing there. I would try something at the thermostat, it wouldn't work. I would then go or I'd run into a problem and I'd have to look at something on the, on the net. And so, this idea of, of cross session searching is also not a new concept. Um, we've been aware and studied this for a long time, um, but my PhD student, Yon Lee, has been very interested in this from the perspective of 
what is it about cross session searches that makes us stop and restart? And for a long time, if you look at literature on search resumption, um, a lot of the search resumption literature and tools have been focused about helping you pick back up where you left off. Yuan's research has found that that's not always what you need to do. That there are lots of other reasons that you start and stop searches, and some of them you definitely don't want to see the things that you've seen before. So just picking back up where you left off is not always the right answer. So um, Yuan did uh, an empirical validation of a set of categories that Nick Belkin, who was here, I think a week or two ago, and one of his students uh, uh, did a number of years ago. So they sort of theorized these uh, reasons for resuming a search session. And they gave them great names. I, my hat is off to Nick. Uh, transmuting, the task requirements were not clear. And so I had to transmute my task into something different. Spawning, the task had some sub-concepts that I needed to go and understand. It spawned new things, right? Uh, rolling back, the information I found previously didn't work, so now I gotta roll back to a previous position. Lost treatment, I had some of the information, but I lost it, and now I gotta get back to it. Unanswered, I wanted to continue the search that stopped because I didn't find the answer that I was looking for, right? So they've got a bunch of these different um, reasons for resuming sessions. And what Yuan did was she went out and did uh, both a survey study where she asked people to report on a recent cross-session search that they had done, and she did a diary study where she studied 20 people doing long-term tasks for cross-session, and she basically found all of these and has a lot more to say about when they occur, how they occur, and how they impact searching. If you're interested in all that, uh, go read some of her papers. She won the best short paper award at Cheer last year, so I'll recommend that one. And she's in the job market this year. We got to shoot higher. <laughs> um, all right. I also want to talk for just a minute about learning. I know a bunch of people here are interested in learning. So I'll, I'll look at you and your group. Uh, and so we've also been looking at learning during these kinds of tasks and searches. Um, we have been focused on an approach that um, we think is really interesting. Um, we looked at what education has to say about it. Right? So if you go talk to our colleagues in education, they'll tell you all kinds of different things. But one of the things they'll tell you about is blue taxonomy. Right? So if I'm a, a teacher in a grade school, um, I can develop a lesson plan around blue taxonomy, or I can assess whether a student has learned certain concepts. At the lowest level are just, can you remember something? I can remember the capital of Australia is Canberra. Okay? I don't know where it is, I don't know what it looks like, but I can remember it's Canberra. Understand, that's a level up. That says, oh no, I actually can explain things about Canberra to you. I can tell you about the people that live there. I can tell you where it's located. I can tell you North of Melbourne and South of Sydney and things like that. Um, apply. Apply is I can take information that I've learned and use it in a new situation. So maybe I'm doing a procedure, I'm trying to cook something for dinner, and I can actually apply that recipe and, and make it happen. Okay. Analyze. I can compare things. I can analyze differences in things. Evaluate. I can not only analyze those differences, but I can make a decision based on those differences. I can say this method is best for these reasons. And at the very tippy top is create. Create is I'm going to actually create some whole new thing. I'm going to develop a whole new method for water purification based on what I've learned. Okay. So this is a, a common taxonomy that's used for designing lessons and for evaluating student learning in classrooms. There's another dimension to that taxonomy that is called the knowledge dimension that has to do with factual, conceptual, procedural, and metacognitive. So factual information is just facts. Just things that little tidbits that we know are true, basic elements. Conceptual has to do with interrelationships between things. Procedural, how to do something. The metacognitive, thinking about thinking, right? So if you put all that together in this uh, taxonomy, you end up with this sort of two by two thing. And we've been using this as a way to think about learning 
in the learning process when people are doing searching. So let me kind of show you what I mean by this. So um, when I started out my task, I knew that I needed to go flip the switch to the breaker box, turn the power on. And so I remembered a fact. If I turn the breaker box on, it's going to turn the power on. I didn't remember the factual thing. Um, that was based on the fact that I know that the breaker box can cut power to a specific part of the house. But I have a conceptual understanding of what the breaker box does. And so I was able to understand that if I did that action, it was going to cut off power to the, um, the right thing. I knew how to make that happen. I knew that if I did a procedure, a very simple procedure, flip this switch, that it would apply that and cut the power off. Um, procedural test. I knew a test to know whether my voltage tester was working or not. I would hold it near an outlet that I knew was hot, and if it didn't light up, it wasn't working. I knew a procedure that I was able to execute it. Um, when that test failed, I had to create additional tests to figure out why the voltage tester wasn't working. And that involved a little bit of everyday creativity on my part figure out why it wasn't working. Um, I had to analyze and figure out how to open the bat battery door. And um, during this whole process, I was having these metacognitive thoughts like, I can't believe I can't open the battery door. I'm an idiot, right? So I had a lot of metacognitive stuff going on too. So this sort of taxonomy can be used to help us think about how somebody flows through a process when they're both searching and learning. And so we basically um, have, have been developing this, coming up with examples of what each of these cells look like. Some of them are much more common than others, right? So a procedural apply, procedures are often applied. And so procedural apply is very common. Um, but I can also say a procedural remember if I can just quote the steps of merge sort to you, but I don't really understand it, and I just tell you the steps, that's a procedural type of information that I'm just applying at the remember level of cognitive processing. If I really wanted to prove to you that I understand it, I would have to explain something about merge sort, demonstrate to you that I understood how to merge sort work, right? Maybe I could run word sort and show you that I can use it to sort a set of numbers. That would be applying it, right? So we've, we've been looking at these different examples as a way to chart people's flow through a learning process. And our PhD student, Kelsey Ergo, is also on the job market this year, you should also hire him, um, is, uh, is been leading a lot of this effort and had done some really interesting studies to look at how people flow through this matrix, what transitions are more common than others, and how we might be able to use those transitions and flows to assist people when they get stuck. Right, I see some nodding and some confused looks. Questions? Sense that you guys wanted to study this diagram for a long time. <laughs> this is in the paper. Yeah, it's fast. I, I had to get closer to see it. I'm really interested in that create column. Uh, You're crossed great. with factual, conceptual, procedural, metacognitive. Yeah, some of these don't occur very often. Well, I mean, so the what I don't see in the box is what I envision. I'm probably going wrong, right? But create facts, create concepts, create procedures, create metacognition. Right. So is we, what I naively we, we did not approach it from the I'm going to creatively come up with facts that are not true. <laughs> we grounded this in the facts were things that were, were going to be true. Were they curated facts in this case? Yeah, so it was more of a curation. Um, we did think about that case though. You know, you could create out of you know thin air some new fact that was not true, but that's that's not the direction we're trying to go with this work. So. 
but you kind of see that people move around with these different, you know, six levels of the dimension. So I think that that's good because people tend to think of that as a more sort of discrete level. Right. But I'm actually really intrigued by that. Actually, people move around. But what about yeah. kind of like, you know, like do you see some transitions across the factual, conceptual, procedure, meta cognitive as well? Because yeah. to me, you know, we kind of get used to factual information right. seeking. Right. More sort of, you know, like right. more investigative and then conceptual. So I'm actually a little bit so I I know, interesting. I know too. that the study that, that Jaime and Kelsey just wrote up um, did look at the transitions and it looked at not only the the transition result, across that not not transition. I don't remember what the results were from that though. Okay. So um, they just published a post paper that is like, it's on the post website, but it's not. Ah, okay, good, good, good. So, okay. okay, thank you. Yeah. What is that acronym you just tell us? Uh, Transactions on Information Systems? ACM. In the ACM journal? Well, just, just on that one. So yeah. I am kind of intrigued by how you populate these spells. So the patient one is giving me a bit of a problem. Yeah. Um, yeah. So you, in this example, you've got the idea that you needed to check your voltage test. Right. Working. Right. So you use the, the standard way of checking that, which is to put it into a live right. output, and, and then that you know is that, that didn't work, right? So mm -hmm. how, how how why is that categorized as creating an additional? Okay, test and right. so, so testing testing the voltage uh, thing by putting it in the socket. That was this cell. Okay. So when what's, when what's that the... when that failed, I then needed to figure out another test, another way to evaluate. You know, okay, it looks like it failed in this socket, but I don't know. I need to figure out how to fix this or how to test it and see if maybe it was just that socket was bad, right? And so creating additional tests was something that was unexpected. I thought I would just hold it up and I would get my answer, but I held it up and I didn't feel like I had an authoritative answer at that point. So it was a, it turns out it's a battery issue. Yeah, it turned out it's a battery issue. So yeah. you consider that a creative test, a cre a creating a new test. So this is a really good point. And I will admit this this is an area that I'm feeling is a little stretched, right? Um, I had this great discussion earlier today with Catherine about um and 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 um shoot, I'm forgetting your name. Uh yeah, uh, about uh Big C and little C creativity, right? So what counts as creativity? And where is the line between problem solving and creativity? And maybe this example is actually following a little bit more on the problem solving side. Um, but there are definitely cases where I would argue we do fall over here into the I'm going to create a procedure that I hadn't thought of before to figure out if something's working or not. And no, that's not Steve Jobs' creativity, but that's everyday creativity. I would argue. Is it Bloom's creativity? That's a great question. That's a really good question. Um, I, I could argue that it is because it is taking knowledge that you have about how the systems work, synthesizing those into some new, new test or new procedure that you didn't know before. Even if it's not new to the world, it could be new to you. And to me, that would count as Bloom's creativity. Bloom's creativity, I don't think, requires us to have brand new knowledge that didn't exist anywhere in the world. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to, to yeah. thin slice it to death, but it, it just, it's the, the goodness of fits between cells and state criteria really matter. They do. So they do. I, I am being well, it's not like and, and, and I will be the first one to tell you that doing this and coming up with these examples took us months. Uh, we argued for hours and hours about these. We went through the Anderson and Craftwell book multiple times. We, we tried to draw on examples, and some of these were ones where we felt like there was something there that was harder to express. And so I think we've done a better job on some of these than we have with others. Yeah, I, I said that. De definitely, definitely. All right. Um, so last up, I've got a few more minutes here. 
Um, because so many of you guys here I know are interested in creativity, I want to talk a little bit about creative aspects of task. And since Andy got us into it, uh, it's a good transition. So um, one of my other PhD students who's now at Google, who you guys, some of you guys know, was Yasek's student. Master's from other program. Yeah, master's student. Uh, Yasek, or I'm sorry, uh, Yin Long Zhang, um, got really interested in how we could support people doing creative tasks. And again, we can have a discussion about where that line of creativity is. Um, he looked at a range of creative tasks. He did one study with people that were doing highly creative artistic things. He did another study that were more of everyday creativity kinds of things. Um, but this idea of everyday creativity is one that I think is, is it's a little bit challenging sometimes. Um, the idea is that we're not, uh, we're all being creative in our everyday lives on a daily basis. We have little things that we have to deal with and come up with creative solutions to. Um, it's not painting the Mona Lisa, but it is solving some problem or doing some creative thing in our, in our everyday life. And so this idea of everyday creativity kind of underlie uh, a good part of this set of results that I'm gonna show you here. Um, the other thing that I'd like to introduce here is the idea that there are creative stages. So Steve Sawyer, um, is uh, faculty at UNC. Some of you guys may have looked at his work before too. Um, he's done a really nice job of synthesizing a whole lot of literature on creativity and creative stages. And he boiled it down to these eight stages. And, you know, people can argue whether it's seven or eight or six or whatever. Find and format the problem, acquire relevant knowledge, gather potentially related information, sit on that, let the ideas percolate and incubate, generate some new ideas, combine those ideas, select the ones that you want to work with, and then execute. This is not a linear process. This has lots of jumping around in it. Um, and if you look at this, the first time I saw this, I was like, this looks like a model of information seeking, right? Find and format the problem acquire knowledge, gather related information. That's really similar to models that we have in information science. And we do not have so many of them generate and combine and select ideas necessarily. So there's some difference here, but there's some uh, similarities as well. So what Ying Wong did to start off with was he did a study, he recruited people on the Mechanical Turk, Amazon Mechanical Turk. He got 175 people to fill out a survey where they told us about a recent experience they had done that involved little c everyday creativity. Right? Could have been building a bird feeder in their backyard. That was a kind of right? something like that. Um, creative tasks involved multiple stages, multiple of those creative stages, not a surprise. Um, and the different creative stages that people did benefited from different resources. Again, this is not one of these like earth shattering results, but it's interesting to see how these things played out. So what Yingong did was he asked people to tell us what resources they used to use web search, to use videos, to use images, to use social sites. And then for each of those things that they said yes to, he said, did you use web search or the find goal stage? Did you use it for the lookup stage? Did you use it for the explore stage? And again, we operationalized a piece of language that people would understand. And what we found, okay, one not really surprising thing, that when you're in the lookup phase, you use search engines. Okay, good. At least the participants understood our directions. When you're in the explore phase, videos were very common. When you were in the combine idea phase, images were playing a big role. Uh, the social sites, it's not that they were especially good for these things, but they were not used or not especially good for these things. Okay. Uh, a few other trends that we noticed, if you were doing a, a task that was very craft oriented, you know, arts and crafty, um, you tended to do less lookup. If you were doing something that was more visual arts related, then you ended up in the create ideas stage a lot more. 
And if you're doing something crafty, uh, you want to also end up in the create idea stage a lot more. Um, so this was uh, some more that they want to do as part of his dissertation. And if you want to, again, know more about it, there's a, a whole series of papers on this. I think I've cited just one up here. Um, and I'm also happy to ask questions about that. Yeah. This is the clarification on social site. Was it uh, ranked as uh, just logging into social site when it was there? Or we gave examples of like discussion forums and things like that. Yeah. yeah. I don't remember exactly what examples we gave. Some yeah. 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 Ye
but um, I'm not quite sure. My interpretation about select ideas has been you do this sort of create and combine ideas, and this selecting is the stage of all right, I've got three possible combinations of things that I could do, and now I have to select one that I'm going to execute. That, that's always been my interpretation of that stage, but definitely you could do some selecting earlier in that process. Okay. All right, um, so just a few things that I'll wrap up with. Um, you know, I've talked about a lot of different concepts related to complex tasks and searching. Um, task complexity is complex. It's not a simple concept. Um, it definitely influences how people search and how they use assistance tools. Assistance tools, need to be contextualized to what somebody is doing at that stage of the search. Um, it also requires a cognitive switch. If somebody is gonna stop doing their search and engage with your assistance tool, that's a cognitive switch and there's a cost to that that you have to provide a payoff for. Um, from the learning perspective, we think that the uh, Anderson and Crathwell Two-dimensional taxonomy is a useful tool for us to think about how learning happens and how people flow through information and learning processes. Um, we're currently doing some work in this area to try to help predict those flows through that process. So we can say, you know, oh, you're at this stage now, you're likely headed in this direction. We can provide you some help getting there. Um, we're also interested in using those to um, help provide tools that can scaffold people in that process. Um, and in, in terms of creative tasks, um, really, again, this idea that we don't support certain kinds of filtering and relevance creative criteria for creative, certain creative stages. There are very few tools that we found out there that can really help you do divergent thinking in a, in a search process. Um, and you know, maybe some of those are specialized tools, but um, they're, they're sort of not there. And there are definitely some parallels between that creative search process and information seeking models. Um, I put over here on the side, I think Nick Duncan mentioned when he was here, uh, this squirrel workshop from 2018 that he and I were both part of. Um, one of the things that Nick and I talked about at that workshop was the need to push out search into the environment. Right? And I think that this work also emphasizes that. Um, many of the things that were sort of outlined at that workshop as future research directions for the whole IR community fit with that theme. Um, you know, we need to understand cognitive aspects of what people are doing. We need to investigate how search systems can actually aid users in the context they're in. We need to explore how people can be helped moving through a learning process. Um, if you're a PhD student and you're looking for topics to do in interactive IR, go read this scroll report. This is an outline to all the things that we thought in 2018 were really important to study. And you can subtract two years, right? So it's still up to date. Um, so I think that's a good place to stop. Um, let me see if you guys have any questions. But we have about 10 minutes. More questions? Yes. Thank you for the talk. Yeah. Uh, so my question relates to complexity, and uh, I'm asking this because I am trying to figure this out in my own work. So does the complexity uh, of interacting with a highly complex systems somehow affect people's trust in their own performance of the task? Uh, or their sense of self efficacy that we also get not from that system is that trustworthy? Is it worthy of their trust? Or can you reflect on that? I think, that's a, I think that's a really good question. Um, we haven't necessarily done a lot of work looking at trust in the system, but we have definitely, in some of these studies, looked at users' um, confidence in the output they produced, right? Okay, so like in the work box study, that was one of the things that we looked at. Um, and I think systems can have an impact there, right? So for example, um, 
if I want to have confidence that I've covered the whole space of information, um, how do I even know, right? If I've just been kind of wandering around looking at stuff, I don't know. But if I put it in the org box, I can see it. I can say, oh, there's a whole patch over here that I put in the nest. That I, I enabled was going to be important, and I never pulled anything in on. Mm -hmm. So I think that kind of confidence uh, can be held for some of these tools. In terms of trust, though, like do I trust the information sources? Do I trust the results of the search engine? Do I trust the ranking? That's a, a whole different question. And um, I think some of the work that uh, you guys are doing, Yasek and Matt and, and other folks in Alabra, is really interesting in that respect, right? So uh, the idea of how can we uh, display things in the search interface that are going to provide indicators to users about what type of resource this is, what biases it might have, mm -hmm. and do I even trust those indicators, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, I have a question on the um, evaluation. Uh, for uh, studies in the intellectual retrieval. I, uh, I think in uh, School 2018 talks about um, that, uh, but I want to uh, know your thoughts about um, using uh, a service for evaluation ah, similar to yes. system oriented yeah. uh, evaluation. Do you think that's a, a, a Something that is feasible in interactive retrieval. Yeah, so this is this is a debate that we have every time we design a study. It's like, okay, we've got all these methods available. Which ones are we going to use in this study? Which ones do we think are going to give us the best data? Right. Um, we have survey methods. We have questionnaires that we can ask after somebody's done a task in the lab. We have lots of different methods that we can use. Um, I, I definitely feel like when you bring people in the lab. They're they're in a different environment, right? I mean, they're they're it's just not the same as when they're at home doing these tasks at home. But as an experimentalist, I like being able to control those factors, right? And there's definitely the need to control factors in in a lab study, so you can say something about what the effects might be. Um, I I as I've done more research over my career. Uh, I really have come to the belief that it is put, putting together little pieces of a puzzle. And that each of us is contributing one piece in each study we do. That um, I'm going to do a study that is a lab based study that used questionnaires after the tasks to measure things about people's perceptions about the impact of the interface or the impact of the search system or something. And I'm, I'm going to find some answers. And then somebody else is going to go do a study that's a longitudinal study. It does qualitative analysis that looks at how people did this in real life. And maybe our results are going to line up, and maybe they're not. But we're going to learn something from the combination of all of that. And so um, what I usually do when we're designing these studies is I try to think about one, what's going to give us the best data, two, what's feasible. And unfortunately, feasible almost always wins. Um, you know, there's I would love to bring participants in the lab and have them do four tasks so that I can get within subject data on this, but I can't keep them in the lab for three hours. And so I'm only having to do two tasks. Um, I don't know if I'm answering your question though. Yes, uh, I think partly, uh, but I'm also interested in uh, an approach where um, we could have, I, I know also at UNC, you have developed a database for tasks. The yeah. developing task is one of the challenges in yeah. the evaluation, but looking at it from the angle where we can have a platform, some platform that people can uh, put in their tasks right. and uh, right. make to make uh, yeah. evaluation yeah. easier. And I think some of that, uh, for those of you guys who don't know, we have a database that I'm not sure if it's actually available right now, maybe down. But there's a task database for information retrieval tasks that people have used in studies. Barbara Wildman and Luann Thorne. And, uh, and were you involved in that? No, Luann and Barbara. and Barbara was it. Put it together. Um, and uh, the idea of when we give people tasks, we have to be super careful, right? I mean, 
the, the example that I gave up with those objective subjective dimensions and the items that drilled home to me how important a single word in a task can be, right? And and so when we impose tasks, when we give tasks to people to do, um, they are picking up on little subtle clues in those task wordings that we give them. Um, and and it, it's, it, it's a difficult thing, right? Um, I think task databases can be a way to help with that. You can standardize on some tasks, but the other thing is that I've almost always found that when I get into the design of the study, there's some aspect of it that we're trying to focus on. There's some nuance that we're trying to get at. And I can take inspiration from other people's tasks, but we almost always have to customize them. Questions? Can I ask one more? Yeah. So uh, I was thinking of my own habits when it comes to searching. So, and I was thinking of interactive IR classic versus perhaps interactive IR for the cohort, the generation that has grown up with more than just Google as a way to search. But if I evaluate my own behaviors, so I tend to look at, go straight to YouTube, to yeah. search for something that I am, uh, I know that I need a demonstration of. Right. Versus going to Amazon if I need something that I need a ready made solution for, so right. for a task or for a client. Google is increasingly only limited to academic stuff or maybe some follow up on something that I came across. So, how is that being uh, uh, becoming part of that? This literature? That, right that's now? a great question. Um, I had a reporter from the New York Times contact us recently asking if I could say something about. Uh, people using TikTok to do searches. And I was like, no, I can't say anything about that. I, I don't know. Um, but there are definitely people looking at that. Um, so I mentioned this to the, the doctoral seminar this morning. Um, one of my colleagues at UNC, Francesca Tripodi, um, has really been looking at some of those aspects of what people are doing with social media, with other kinds of sites, like you mentioned, Amazon and other things um, to satisfy search needs. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think it is an area that needs more attention. Um, the people that I've been seeing doing it fall a little more on the social science side than I typically do. Not that I'm not, I appreciate everything that they're doing, but I look a little bit more on the interface side. Um, but yeah, yeah, I'm, I mean, Everything that we know about search engines and how people interact with search engines, we've been studying that for years and we we understand a lot about it. Do we understand anything about how people search on TikTok? I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, if I can actually respond to that, I think that like a long time ago when I was doing some diary study where I was looking at the like the relationship between the nature of the search task and then kinds of platform they choose, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not just really topic like academic task versus everyday task. It's actually a lot more nuance in terms of the significance of the task, right? <laughs> the consequences of using wrong information, right? And then this is like a really long-term goal versus very immediate, like, you know, instant kind of like a satisfaction. So there are all these dimensions of such tasks that, that really influence the kinds of resource or platform they, they choose. So I think that that can go, I think there are really great potential to look at that. That, that resonates with something that Elon found in his dissertation work on, on creative searches. Um, so people were telling us that they would search on Pinterest when they wanted to find high quality artist images created by other artists. They would not go to Google image search for that. They would go to Pinterest for that because that's, they knew that's where that information lived. And so, yeah, I think that idea of where's the segmenting happening and how is it happening among the different resources um, is, is definitely. Yeah, that a very focused yeah. search versus yeah. very, you know, scientific kind of search, all these dimensions that will, you know, affect. All right, thank you so much.